The drama never stops, but I'm not, oh, honestly, look, I'm not trying to just, like, whip up drama. I, I hope it doesn't seem like I am. I'm obviously producing content off of this stuff, but, you know, I just, I'm telling a story, and I'm trying to do it in a way that's balanced. So, obviously, today, Fabiano, just, like, minutes ago, beat Hans Niemann in a uh, game over the board, a classical match. They had a game that veered on a draw several times, but, um... Fabi found a way to get a extra pawn at the end. And then he gave an interview. My overall impression of this report after like rereading parts of it is like, ah, I don't know. This feels bizarre and I don't really like this move that chess.com has done. Because the main question that's still not really answered is like, why did they let him play for so long? Okay, he hasn't cheated in two years, right? Why have they just let him play on their site for so long and then now decided to suddenly ban him? And they don't explain that. They just talk around that, in my opinion. You know, it's just a very self-serving document. It's like they're trying to advertise how good their cheat detection software is. There's some interesting stuff when you reread it. Like, just the way they, like, cite what they choose to cite. Here they cite top players saying how much of a problem cheating is and I didn't realize this when I was doing my stream last time but they fucking cite Maxime Blugi <laughs> the guy we started last stream talking about because uh Hans Niemann studied with Maxime Blugi and both of them have had accounts uh kicked off of chess.com for cheating so Maxime Blugi runs a chess school somewhere in New York or Connecticut or something and chess.com chose to use his quote um, and this is a very fascinating quote. This is after um, he, I think, like helped catch someone cheating. Like he detected someone cheating at a tournament and caught them. And then he gave this interview. He said, this is Maxime Delugi. I watched him very carefully. When he played this move, knight b7 against Sarek, uh, he took 10 seconds. It was a 5 to 10 minute thing in my modest opinion since the knight could take on f5 instead. But when he decided it in 10 seconds, I was shocked. He doesn't know when to put on the theatrics. You have to be strong enough to do that. If I had this gadget, he's talking about the gadget that the cheater had. If I had this gadget, Maxime Delugi said, I would be killing people left and right and nobody would know. At the critical junction, you switch it on and find out which way do I go. Oh, this little nuance I didn't see. Okay, fine, boom, goodbye, that's it. At that point, you may think for a long time, although you know the move. But this guy doesn't know, he just mechanically is playing the first move of the computer. Everyone is a clown to him. He says Kirill Georgiev put me in a bunker with him and I will destroy him. The guy has no moral compunctions, he is absolutely immoral. Wow, so very interesting choice of Chess.com to include a quote of someone who they just leaked emails to the uh, media about this person having been uh, kicked off after admitted uh, admitting to cheating several times. Someone who I wouldn't think chess.com would actually want to bring attention to because a lot of people are criticizing how many chances they gave Maxime Blugi. They're so quick to give a grandmaster or another, another titled player a, a new account with the title and the diamond membership. They're very quick to give it back. Hans Niemann got a six month ban according to emails that are in here that we didn't go over last time. So anyways, that, that's the big thing, selective cheating, everybody's talking about, you know, and it's very, it's a very good point. But uh, chess.com actually goes on to talk about how they can detect even that, and they give specific emails right at the end, which we didn't go over, um, where they're interacting with people titled 2,700 plus players that they caught cheating. And it shows how they got the player to admit that they were cheating. They ask, can you confirm you played in this event? They say, can you tell me what you were planning to do? The player said, <laughs> just like I'm said, as we mentioned earlier, we've made no public statements regarding the reasons for your account closure or our findings and anything that happens in this conversation will remain confidential. However, for us to move forward, we need you to confirm whether or not you played in this event. And the person responds, finally, yes, I played in the event. And the fair play team responds, after reviewing your games, we want to tell you that we are very impressed by your play. You are truly a strong chess player with a gift for the game. It's like a pat on the head. We know you worked hard to achieve the status you have in the chess world, and we respect your commitment to chess. What we can tell you is that our system is designed to look past the strong moves of even the best human chess players in history and detect patterns of influence from engines that amount to a certainty that we can stand behind. 
Sadly, in your case, we are still certain of the, at the very least, the semi-regular influence of engines in your games. Please note that we are not suggesting you used engine analysis in every position or in every game, but our algorithm is still able to discern patterns that are not human in your approach and consistent enough for us to be sure that you accessed illegal assistance at times. Uh, we understand this is a very interesting part of this email. And again, Chess.com is leaking their own emails with 2,700 plus grandmasters. They have a sort of duality of uh, an approach to transparency, I would say. Honestly, their public statement that they did on Twitter was enough, where they just said, we have evidence that proves that you were not being honest in your interview. I don't think they even had to release it, honestly, but I think everyone already believed them. So anyways, they say, uh, we understand that sometimes people do this because they believe others are also doing it. That's very true. It's the wolf mentality. Perhaps this was the case for you. <laughs> Perhaps this was the case for you? We are also aware that some coaches use their accounts to play with students and that maybe at times you allowed yourself to access resources you knew were not allowed based on the terms of the game? Either way, we must stand by our findings and ask that you come forward with a more forthcoming confession of the resources you used and how often you use them. See, that is very true. Like, that's all you want. For accountability, people just have to, you know, say what they did. If you are to provide an honest admission of your approach in your games on chess.com, we'd be happy to work with you to open a new, fresh account with title, diamond membership, and a clean slate on chess.com. Wow. Why don't they just, like, give them a kiss on the face, too? God forbid someone should have to not have a chess.com account after cheating in a moneyed tournament. Okay, so now they get the response. You know, now that they've shown their cards, they get the response from the 2700 plus uh, anonymous grandmaster who says, Hello, I already wrote you in the previous emails that I will fully cooperate. I used help only in a few games, not because I wanted to win a prize, but because I was bored and just wanted to see how good is your team. <laughs> what? Before that, I was sure that everybody is doing it. Now I see that your team is very serious and good. I want to apologize for my behavior. This will never happen again. I am sorry for what I did and feel ashamed about the fact. Thanks a lot for giving me this chance and did not made this public. Actually, I was surprised you catched me because I cheated only in five games in this blank. I cheated games blank, blank, blank. The others I didn't. That's why I think you are doing a fantastic job. Once again, I apologize for my behavior. Best of regards. Okay, so what do you think about chess.com not revealing these names? This is the first big question of the night we have to talk about. What responsibility does chess.com have to publicize the names of titled players? I'm not saying regular people, but titled players, it's their profession. Chess is their profession. Does chess.com have the responsibility to reveal the names? Is it is it like reporting someone to like, you know, a licensing board? Like, should these people... Because I think the simple answer is like, chess.com just needs to communicate this information, not to the public. They don't have to like public, publish a newsletter, but they should communicate it to FIDE and, you know, national uh, organizations, chess organizations. I don't think they need to be leaking these emails. It's, that's what I mean by like a dualistic approach to transparency. Or uh, It's like, why, why are you being this transparent about this? You need to be less transparent, but also more transparent at the same time. We don't need to see the emails and stuff, but you should probably communicate all of the cheaters who you genuinely suspect of cheating. You are certain they're cheating, enough to ban their account. Um, you should communicate that. You should have to communicate that to international and national chess organizations. And I think that's kind of just like a simple, this isn't that complicated. And it's not about Hans Niemann. It's uh, like, wh why is that not just like a simple answer to this whole problem? And yeah, people should face some accountability over the board. I mean, you have um, Ivan Sokolov, a grandmaster saying, Cheating in chess discussions. Many claim cheating online is not as bad as over the board. Sorry, it is exactly the same. I like his writing style. The only reason online cheaters do not do over the board is that they did not yet figure out how to do it, but would love to. Cheating, lifetime ban, game has to be clean. I agree with all that except the lifetime ban thing. I don't necessarily think it should be a lifetime ban, but um, I think the rest of that is very, very well put. Um... You know, we said that cheating over the board is worse because it takes more effort, but this is another way to flip that exact same idea that doesn't really say, well, it's less effort to cheat online, but it says, like, why should you be rewarded with leniency when 
you're just lazy in addition to immoral. Okay, wait, okay, so we're not done, okay. So chess.com responds, hi, thank you for your honesty and prompt responses regarding this case. Thanks for your prompt responses? Why are you, chess.com is eager to have this situation resolved in a way that doesn't require them to make a public statement that could open them up to defamation. The biggest part of their agreement is they have the, the person take responsibility. Okay, so anyways, they responded to this person saying, thank you for your honesty and your prompt responses regarding this case of you cheating and us being very lenient with you. After reviewing your admission as well as our policy regarding such circumstances, we are prepared to offer you the following terms to return to chess.com. You will need to open a new account complete with a new username and with a new email. Oh man, that's intense. Oh shit, they are serious. You will be banned from playing in any titled Tuesdays, probably, uh, or other cash prize events on chess.com for one year. One year ban, what do you think of that? What do you all think of that? One year ban, one year ban, one year ban. Going once, going twice, one year ban for cheating in uh, a tournament. And it was potentially a money tournament, potentially a titled Tuesday, they don't want us to know. One year ban for a, a titled grandmaster with anonymity. One year ban from chess.com. Now, people probably figure out when someone gets banned that they're, they were cheating, but should it be at all more public? I think a one year ban is extremely lenient. I would say three year ban. I mean, are we trying to stop cheating? I mean, a little bit more is not that crazy. I mean, I don't, people don't have the human right to have a chess.com account. Yeah, you will promise one more time never to use engine or other forms of illegal assistance again, understanding that any further violations will lead to a lifetime ban on chess.com. I thought they gave Maxime Delugi a third chance. Did I make that up? I hope not. Please respond to all parties on this email with your acknowledgement of these terms and with the new username you wish to have as a titled player and for your diamond mem membership. I mean, don't even, don't give him the diamond membership, y'all. Come on. Hello, thanks for the second chance. Of course, I promise never again to break the rules. If there is no way to keep my blank account. Oh, you're fucking negotiating at this point? You're like, really? I can't keep my account? There's, there's a consequence? And then we see, so I don't know why chess.com is showing this. I don't know why they're publishing this. But then we see them sending this internally. Okay, this is just from like one chess.com like department to others. They're saying like, to look at the exchange. Surprisingly, it was this simple. While I'm not sure the intent is honest based on his tone in prior emails, I don't think it matters. And as long as Bank agree that this is in line with our report, I'm more than happy to re-onboard. The next person says, this is the number blank, and that looks like one digit. No, that could be two digits. This is the number blank chess player in the world, chess.com says to itself privately admitting to us that he cheated. There certainly has to be some celebration for our ability to identify it, but it's still a solemn place to be. I'm just glad we were able to confidently draw the conclusion. I have no reason to mistrust his statement that he only cheated in specific games. It lines up more or less with what we noticed in our manual review. And then another chess.com person says, I normally don't ever boast, but I must say I'm impressed with myself. The guy is 2,700 plus. He's a monster. It's hard to imagine him cheating in a vacuum. Okay, so there are some, uh, some other cool things that we haven't, um, we haven't seen yet. There's a lot of things that happened even just in, in the last like few days of this whole rigmarole. Okay, we had Hans Niemann, like the way they handled this first interview. I mean, it's hard because like we were watching Christian Chirilla, like he has a podcast with Fabiano, who's in the tournament playing against uh, Neiman right now. And now he's working for the tournament and interviewing Hans Neiman. So it's like a little bit of a, I'm not gonna say it's a conflict of interest, but it's definitely a little strange. So this was um, after round one, Neiman won. So obviously there's all this pressure. This report comes out the night before, I believe. It comes out and then Neiman plays the first round and wins as black. Um, and he, be he beats uh, Christopher Yu, but that's, uh, that's not relevant, or is it? That's a cliffhanger. So check this out. So this is the interview after Hans wins round one, uh, St. Louis uh, U.S. Chess Championship. Thank you, Yasser. We are with Hans Niemann after a, an incredible victory with the black pieces against a fellow junior, Christopher Yu. Hans, 
first of all, let's address the elephant in the room. You've been under a lot of pressure. I feel like he got nervous and that's why he brought this up because you're not supposed to go to this like at the first question. I mean, and I feel like he knows that. The elephant in the room, you've been under a lot of pressure. Tell us a bit about that. Well, um, I think that this game is a, is a message uh, to everyone. And, uh, you know, this entire thing started with me saying chess speaks for itself. And uh, I think that this game spoke for itself and uh, showed uh, the chess player that I am. And uh, it also showed that um, I'm not going to back down and I'm going to play my best chess here, uh, regardless uh, of the pressure that I'm under. And that's all I have to say about this game. And, uh, you know, chess speaks for itself. You know, that's all I can say. Let's discuss. And I think that's great. You know what I mean? I have no problem with that. I don't expect. That's great. That's more than enough. He doesn't have to say more than that. But the game sorry, a little that's, bit. that's it. But uh, you huh? know, you can leave it to your interpretation. But thank you. But I, I don't think leaving the interview is a great call. <laughs> but I mean, to each their own. That is. That's it. All you want to that's say. That's all I like to say. Yes. Okay, because it was such a beautiful game. I don't even need to describe it. Thank you. Right, I mean, that's it. I. That's never gonna impress me. Uh, is all I can say. That it's just the thing about me. I'm not impressed by that sort of behavior, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I love Yasser's response. Thank you. What? That's it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I actually had one question. If we're still in studio, I guess not. <laughs> no, has has disappeared. Um, so, anyways, the next day, Christopher Yu, who lost that game to Hans, gives an interview, and this is how his first question goes. How do you feel? You just took down the defending U.S. champion with the black pieces. I feel like it's a great redemption from yesterday. Especially after after seeing the interview and everything, I felt like I was kind of disrespected. Mm. And it was also kind of a wake-up call that I really needed to improve my openings and everything. How did you feel after that game yesterday? Because you had your chances. So that was interesting, and it really uh, stuck with a lot of people that he said that. Like, he didn't have to bring up Hans's interview, but he felt disrespected by it. But then he said the next day he clarified that, that it wasn't exactly what he meant and maybe he misspoke, so check it out. Did that uh, feeling of disrespect fuel you into this <laughs> round as well? I think I, I think I might, maybe could have worded it better. I, I felt like the interview might have been a bit disrespectful, but I'm, I wouldn't say I personally felt disrespected by it. Got yeah. it, got it. Now yeah, I mean, that's fair enough. And like, you could say it's not disrespectful if you feel like it's not, I mean, it's, it's intended to be like, I don't want to be here. And like, that's, you know, he has the right to do that. So it's whatever. But um, yeah, so you, you know, clarified. Okay, it's not what he meant. Yeah, he seems great. And like, and so that's just one thing I want to say. Like, so people are saying nowadays, like, okay, so what? Is Hans's uh, crime that he's cheating or that he's not polite? You know, that he's not the normal, typical, like, shy, polite or whatever. And obviously those are two separate things. But like... It's definitely very rare to see um, this in chess. I mean, just this. You know, this entire thing started with me saying chess speaks for itself, and uh, I think that this game spoke for itself. And I'm not going to say grandmasters are never cocky. Yeah, they obviously have egos, but it's definitely different from the norm. So since all this spotlight on cheating, there's been some interesting sort of like side uh, developments. For instance... The chess president of uh, Norway, Joachim Berger Nielsen, admitted that he had cheated when he was part of the chess team Norway Gnomes. He then resigned, uh, which, yeah, makes sense. It's not like he's, he's not done being a chess player, I don't believe, but he's, uh, he admitted to cheating, so he resigned um, his position as president of the, the chess organization, the Norway chess organization. And it was part of the Pro Chess League online tournament in the 2016-2017 season. Now, interestingly, I found a Reddit post that said, you should know that Hans Niemann was on the Norway Gnomes, which is the same team, the same Pro Chess League team, uh, the first time he cheated. So this is a confusingly worded post. They mean the first time in 2020 that he cheated, I assume. So yeah, apparently he played for the Norway Gnomes. <laughs> I mean, okay. That's him. I don't, the other guy's not on the, maybe because, oh, this is a specific year. Yeah, okay. Cool. Okay, whatever. I mean, what does that mean? Because Magnus was also on that team a few times. So, 
Um, which, speaking of Magnus, there's been some Norway media he's been in. This is from today. Magnus basically, I guess, is feeling pretty good about how things are going. There are indications that things are going to change at least, that cheating with a computer is looked at in a slightly different way, whether it is online or on a board. This is just an auto translation, by the way. He let I stand on mine be the only thing he would say about the chess drama on Thursday, but on Friday he took the time to respond more fully about the debate that had has come in the wake of him, his sensational actions. The world champion withdrew from the Singapore Cup tournament after losing to Hans Niemann. Yeah, I know. Wait, this is <laughs> Wait, look at the look at the auto English translation of this. And since then the debate about cheating in chess has ridden the sport like a mare. <laughs> Yo, I want to learn Norwegian. What the fuck? Costing Norwegian chess president Joachim Berger Nielsen his job. Um, a lot has happened in recent years when the pandemic came with the Champions Chess Tour Online and the tournaments Chess.com organizes, which has meant that online chess has gone from being something people didn't take so seriously to being on equal footing with chess across the board. That's going to change and that's good. I was surprised to learn that FIDE rapid ratings don't change from Champions Chess Tour Rapid Tournaments. I definitely assume they were uh, FIDE rated. I mean, they're, they're, they're these huge super tournaments. And I heard Fabi say in a podcast, they're not rated. I was really surprised. The only other thing he said was, I had envisioned a debate, and it has been. So, okay, good. What else? Oh, yeah, this was so weird. Oh, my God. Chess.com, bro. Okay, chess.com says, several days after returning to Norway, Magnus shared in a private, like, wh what, what is this private conversation? This is after the Sinkefeld Cup game where he withdrew and then went back to Norway. So now chess.com is telling us about a fucking private conversation. Now, is this with Daniel Wrench? Who, who is this? And how did they get permission? And why are they including this? And this is so not something they should have included in this report. I guess they felt like they had to go into Sinkefeld a lot to justify the timing of their decision. I want to look at that for a sec before we look at what I was just about to say. I want to look at exactly what they say about the timing. Okay, here it is. Here it is. So they do say they had suspicions about Hans's play against Magnus at the Sinkefeld Cup, and that was a big reason. Because other, all this stuff was the same. None of that changed in 2021 or 2022. This is the only thing that changed. And then this is just like, so what are you, you're going to make that part of your, how are you going to draw those lines? And what, why are you going into that? You don't need to. And then they just say that they're this tournament. Yeah, okay, but they have other tournaments with a lot of money he's probably been in. Like, why has that been okay, right? We recognize that the timing of these decisions was not ideal, but we had very few days to find a replacement participant. That doesn't explain why you waited so long. So I guess the Sinkefeld thing really was what did it for them. I mean, I don't know what else I'm supposed to say. They don't believe he cheated in this game. They just did it on suspicion. They just allowed suspicion to make them do what they should have done two years ago, I guess. Closing Hans's account is totally fair. Someone who has cheated, you think they've cheated 100 games on your fucking site? You could close their account after two games. And I would say, yeah, fair enough. What the fuck is wrong with this person? They're abusing your website. But they tolerated it. Or they didn't care. I mean, they, they were fine. He hasn't cheated in two years. And so they were fine with him on their site and playing in their moneyed events, I assume. But then they, it changed with this over-the-board game against Magnus. And that is so fucking dumb and emotional. And they fucked up. And now they're trying to cover their ass, just like Magnus is. Uh, doesn't mean they're fully wrong. I'm not trying to say they're fully wrong. Neither is Magnus at all. There's a lot of justification to a lot of the aspects of what they're doing. But it could have been done much better. So yes, okay, let's go to now what we were just looking at. So here, they say, Several days after returning to Norway, Magnus shared in a private conversation that his experience in playing Hans was, quote, unlike a game he's ever had. He emphasized that he has competed against numerous prodigies and players who, quote, exert themselves and show great effort throughout a long, difficult fight like this game. He described Hans's level of exertion as, quote, effortless and felt he never had a chance to get back in the game, which was extremely unusual for Magnus, who is known for his resourcefulness. This all sounds to me like tilting, much more tilting than it is evidence of Hans cheating. Hans's lack of emotion or excitement about the result was also noted by several others. Below are examples of the reactions of notable players 
who have beaten Magnus. Oh, thanks, chess.com. Yeah, no, yeah, no, I wanted you to, I wanted you to link to five examples of what the human body can do when it beats Magnus in chess. That's a very normal thing for you to compile in this report. Yeah, no, no, I'm going to watch them all, but Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's excited. I mean, yeah, I'd say he's a little excited. I mean, okay, he's a chess player. But uh, then we have Esipenko. That's just amazing. The historic moment, he stopped the clock, 18 year he's old emotional. grandmaster He's Andrei actually emotional. Esipenko he almost cried, that was like, the world champion wow. In a classical game. Wow, he, he just gulped and like almost teared up. Like that's, this is, I didn't actually realize this was going to be it. The historic moment, he stopped the clock. 18 year old grandmaster Andrei Yesipenko just beat the world champion in a classical game. I remember that game. I remember all these games. Okay, so he's excited. Uh, he's... He's on cloud nine, I mean. He also has Magnus's respect, which is a good feeling. Look at that, that he is exhausted from Look at the that. fight that he just brought to the world champion. Yeah, and I know that you all know that I am not trying to <laughs> pretend to be a body language expert, but th this is still so much fun to check this all out, okay. I'm sorry, is there no audio for this one? Dude is very chill. He's a very chill guy. I'd say he's a little excited. Okay, here we have Prague. Has beaten Magnus Carlson for the first time. Prague OP guys in the chat. Prague OP. Amazing. Magnus is left. Amazing. And look at Prague. He is not feeling anything. He's so relaxed. He's like, okay. Oh, no, nah, I think happened. he's shocked. It's like, you know, it's happened. Finally. The moment. RP. I think the whole India was waiting for that this. That was moment. really amazing. Right, oh, yeah. These are all very cool guys. And like, look, we can all have people we like. Um, all, all these players are very unique and you can like whoever you like, you know, but yeah, if I was a fan of Hans, I would definitely want him to publicly admit that his cheating was more extensive than he had indicated because that would definitely make him more, you know, you know, good. Okay. So anyways, this is after looking at all those, this is how Hans, uh, this is how it went with Hans and Magnus. I don't know if it's any different. Uh, I'm not trying to imply that it is. Okay. Let's check it out. In G4 setup because it doesn't. Yeah, and there, there we have it. Handshake. There we have it. Wow. What a result. What wow. a result, guys. Truly. Wow. I can just imagine the chat going uh, nuts at this point. Like, uh, what are we? What have we witnessed? The the Sinkville Cup. What is it about the Sinkville Cup? I mean, guys, uh, the Fabi, the streak. Uh, the number of decisive games, the... Look at Peter's Fiddler. The crazy games, the good games. Uh, and now we have this. Yeah, this is... Uh, I wow. Mean, I mean, he... Uh... Okay, so my... Just putting this out there, I would... This, this is complete speculation. But if I were going to speculate, I would say Yasu Sarawan is less aware of the sort of, like, perception of Hans as having cheated significantly. I would say he's less aware of that compared to Peter Svidler. Um, my guess would be Peter Svidler is younger. I think he's closer friends with probably some of the people who might know about this kind of stuff. I'm just totally speculating. And then, and then this was Hans. It's just to, you know, look at the sort of mentality of someone who beats the world champion. Certainly the man of the hour, two and a half out of three. A dream start for you, Hans. Okay, what's your opinion? It's, it's not bad, no. Was, he just he played quite poorly, so uh, I didn't do anything special. So I don't. I've never heard someone beat Magnus and then 
start their interview by saying that he played very poorly. I don't know if this is Hans trying to be self-deprecating, like, oh, it wasn't me being amazing, it was him playing poorly. And obviously it's true that Magnus made some mistakes, but, like, you don't open your interview by saying that your opponent played poorly. We just went, well, okay, I think I played quite well. But uh, I was actually very fortunate uh, that this opening came on the board, and I looked at this today. And you, you guessed this opening today? No, I did not guess it, but, but some miracle. I had checked this today, and it's like, it's... Okay, interesting. We already talked about that. Oh, yeah, we didn't look at this yet. This happened yesterday. After, you know, all that stuff about disrespect and Christopher Yu saying disrespect and taking it back, this is them talking about it with Wesley So, the current U.S. chess champion, the all-star. I love him as a player. Well, speaking of all I that, was winning at some point, yeah. He actually came to the studio and uh, he said that he felt disrespected on every level by Hans's previous interview, not mentioning maybe his uh, name or saying that the game spoke for itself because it was so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, how do you see that whole interaction between these uh, two young men? Well, I guess that can be expected of Hans. I mean, he's disrespected like pretty much everybody in the chess world now yeah? <laughs> at this stage, calling uh, other players idiots and stuff, <laughs> and also beating the great Magnus. But uh, and how the chess production team here is definitely on point. Like I, I've really never seen such quick reflexes with like panning to who's being talked about. Other players idiots and stuff, <laughs> and also beating the great Magnus. But. So people are talking about, like, how much is Wesley So even being serious here? Because he says that Hans is being disrespectful by beating the great Magnus, which is obviously a joke. But was it all a joke? I mean, why would he say any of this if it was all a joke? I don't think it's all a joke. I mean, he's disrespected, like, pretty much everybody in the chess world now. <laughs> I mean, is that a joke? Am I, is my satire detector dead? No, I mean, that, I don't, it wouldn't elicit the laugh like that. Like, that's like a so true laugh, not like, a, Wesley So never says negative things about people, so, yeah, it's kind of, like, confusing. At, at this stage, calling uh, other players idiots and stuff. But, like, when you think about it, what is he talking about? He is talking about this, which kind of makes sense. This was not the interview we just looked at. This is round five, two rounds later. He had just drew against, uh, I believe, Lenier Dominguez. This was the passionate interview that he gave that everybody, you know, loved. Okay, maybe that was a bit too... Okay. And then, okay, first of all, the Magnus opening. Okay. Now, uh, let's get to, get to that. So people were saying that uh, there was no idea why I checked this. Well, first of all, you know, people are absolute idiots because the explanation I'm going to give is going to make you all look, all the top GMs look like total idiots. So... The position, first of all, they said there was zero game. There was a game. Check the database. There's this thing in chess called transpositions, okay? I'm not saying this is like a horrible thing or, or anything, but this is certainly not my style of how I like when people communicate. It doesn't seem like a joke to say... It can be expected of Hans. I mean, he's disrespected like pretty much everybody in the <laughs> chess world now at, at this stage, calling uh, other players idiots and stuff. <laughs> I mean, that's just not an exaggeration. And this doesn't mean Hans is some awful person for saying that. It's not, it's not that big of a deal, but yeah, I mean, that's not a good look. Oh, there was also this funny thing, which is an exchange between Hans Neiman and Anish Giri. I guess they are like little, I guess Giri loves having these like little bully friend, frenemy relationships on social media with other grandmasters. So this was in May of this year, Neiman posted, is it safe to say that I'm not a streamer anymore? Because I, I, I assume he means, like, I'm more than just a streamer. And I'm sorry that he felt the need to have to assert that. I mean, it's, you know, from one streamer to another, it doesn't have to define you. I mean, if I meet someone at a party, I'm not going to be like, yeah, I'm a streamer. But okay, you're asserting yourself. Geary responds, congrats on crossing that magical 2685.3 barrier, <laughs> which is pretty good. Because it's like, yeah, at what point are you not a streamer? Like, it has nothing to do with what you screenshotted. So Hans Neiman responds, you've got two years max before I pass you. Maybe it's time to make less chessable courses and play more tournaments. And Geary says, oh, don't you dare aim for that Dutch number one spot. Which is funny. I mean, I don't know why they wouldn't be talking about the like world rankings. But yeah, it's a funny joke. Hans says, Jordan will take care of that for me, which at this point, I'm sorry, but this is not playful anymore. You, you, come on. Now he's going out of his way to say Jordan Van Forest 
is going to beat gear. Like that's not a playful barb. I, I, okay, okay. I could I could see it as a playful barb. In a certain context, it's just very hard to imagine. That's a, look. Why, why am I pointing this out? Because I find it interesting. It's it's funny to see these grandmasters bicker with each other. I'm not trying to say this is some horrible act or something. It's not a big deal. Yeah, the make less chessable courses. It's too far. Not in the sense that it's too offensive, but in the sense that it like makes you realize he's not joking, which is the only thing I'm sort of curious about. It's not very horrible either. Geary's fine. So Geary responds, "Ha ha." Let's all catch up at the Olympiad. Guess you're coming as a reporter or something? Rough on a post that was about how he's a very legitimate chess player. By the way, I don't know what this is. It's a ranking of like, I guess the under 21 or something? I mean, so guess you're coming as a reporter. So Hans has to respond to that. It says, that one made me laugh. I'll be busy in Dortmund playing Anand and Kramnik, but I'm sure the Dutch team has great chances for a medal. Just wait until I'm on the American team. So that's like interesting. And Geary did not respond. Uh, so it doesn't seem playful to me. Before we move on, first I want to look at this interesting post I found he posted this year. Um, this was April 12th. He said, seventh in the Reykjavik Open. Extremely topsy-turvy event. Six wins, two losses, and only one draw. It was a pathetic performance, and I'll do better in my next tournaments. This was the first of nine consecutive tournaments from now until July. It's going to be a long marathon. Interesting. So Hans is not alone in thinking like this. There are a lot of people who would call themselves like pathetic and insult themselves. It's a way to try to motivate yourself. And it's also a way to try to signal that you have such ambitious ideals of yourself that even, you know, success is not success. So it serves a lot of different like functions for the sort of self uh, view, but it's not a good way to be, and it's not just because it's like not nice, but it really doesn't sustain good functioning long term. There's a reason you don't see a lot of chess players in their interviews like giving sort of like extremely egotistical sort of perspectives. It's because like that doesn't really work long term, and you're gonna make it hard for yourself to. Um, function if you're calling yourself pathetic for coming in seventh place in one of the biggest tournaments. That's not a really effective way for most people to motivate themselves. And then Geary responded to this, once you figure out what is your personal haircut identity, you will reach the top. Go Hans. And Hans said, what do you recommend, Anish? Should I copy your hairstyle? And Anish did, oh, Anish said, anything but please stick with it. The drastic changes are an emotional roller coaster for your fans. Which is, I guess, funny. I mean, I, I like Hans's hair. It's fine. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so coming up to today, what, what was very interesting was Fabiano played against um, Hans. And they played against each other, which was very interesting because this is their first time playing against each other since Fabiano has done, uh, started a whole podcast, essentially. But yeah, done episodes talking about Hans, even going through his games and talking about how some of the moves looked weird. That's uh, G3 is a very strong move. Let's put it that way. So anyways, now they finally played and Fabi won. I was somewhat surprised that I played this. So I, I, I don't know, maybe he missed. Did you get to chat with him after the game at all? Uh, I don't think he wants to chat to, with me anymore. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think we're no longer on chatting terms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Queen C3, Rook uh, D1. Human laughter is such a funny phenomenon. <laughs> Like, it's just, everybody just laughs at that and no one says anything about it. It's so, it's so great. Is it wrong for Fabi to do this type of thing? I think it is. I think this was a misstep, actually. And I think he acknowledged that. I, I saw in one of their recent podcasts, I think it was this one. He said, he made a sarcastic comment like, oh yeah, like it would be dumb to like go through all the games and like speculate about what looked like a, you know, human move. So he acknowledged that he thought it was dumb, and I think it was dumb. It was going too far. But, you know, he, he has the right to give his perspective, but I think going through the games move by move at the point that they did was not a smart decision. Uh, it's too, too anecdotal. Um, so he talks about a few different things. He talks about why Hans... Like, he was part of the like uh, reason Hans was actually selected to come to the Sinkefeld Cup where he beat Magnus. We just had to, we had to vacancy suddenly. And we had maybe like a week, a week and a half to fill them up. It wasn't very long. 
And they gave me a list of players and it's like, I, all five looked fine. But for a very long time, I had wanted to give Hans an opportunity. I had, of course, heard that he had cheated online. I mean, I'm very well connected, or at least like to think that I'm well connected in the chess world. And I had heard of that. And I had heard allegations that he had cheated over the board. I mean, the only issue that I had with it, and one very big issue, is that I've heard of this from so many people. So many people that have been accused of cheating online. Yeah, he means for so many people, not from so many people. So many people that have been accused of cheating over the board. Some, and many I would say, especially cheating online, fully justified. Like, obviously they cheated, they've gotten caught, they've gotten banned. But especially when it comes to over the board, I've heard of so many people cheating. And some of them are like complete nonsense. So some of the allegations are complete nonsense. If you want the St. Louis Chess Club to sit with a magnifying glass and look at every single talented individual that's coming up and being like, hey, you know, what are the centipone losses on this guy's 20 last games? We're not going to do that. I mean, he is clearly a very dedicated player. At that point, there was no real indication that he has cheated online. Even to this day, we don't have any proof or anything like that. And we can't work on allegations. It's a really interesting conversation. But yeah, I mean, I guess I, sh- I want to kind of actually show the game that he beat Hans in today. So we see a, you know, pretty balanced opening, materially equal. Black sort of working on some development. Trading some material down. This is when Black starts getting an edge. Starting to put pressure on that d6, white pawn. And we see the pawn trade there. We see the pawn fall. So now black is up a pawn. Okay? Black is up a pawn just trying to advance. It's still very drawn. Even Okay, so we see a queen trade. Black's going to try to win this rook end game. Fabiano. This is very interesting just to go back a few moves. Fabiano looks to be ready for a draw here, actually. And then Hans rejects the draw. I don't know if Fabi really would have done the draw, but he looked like he was about to. And then Hans didn't do the draw, which is very interesting. And then Fabi, you know, Hans is still not lost until that move. He should have attacked Fabi's pawn to keep the tension um, with the rook, but... So now Fabi gets in the action. It sort of goes away again, though. We see this. I mean, it's not it's not one here for black, but it's oh yeah, yeah. And then this is like the real, it's lost now. What he needed to do was probably oh yeah, rook g2. He had to bring his rook back. Yeah, I, I wonder, do, do we think that chess.com has like any responsibility to pass on the names of, like, grandmasters who cheat to, like, international and national organizations, to pass on the names of, like, maybe any titled player who cheats, has that information shared with their national or international body? I feel like that should be done. Anyway, so here's how Fabi gets the win. He actually lost it for a second, but White had to bring the king towards the rook instead of back to h3. Um, so we do see it all come down now and black has an extra pawn and it's just over. It's just over. So very cool game. Fabi won, gave his interview, very cool, good things. And that's life.